Hey, good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome. Welcome to the scripture habit. Welcome to this space. Uh, our whole goal in being here is to help you develop that habit of getting into scripture. That habit is life changing. It will definitely help you grow in your faith and relationship with God. And so we show up and say, hey, we'll help you. We'll help you show up. We'll meet you here. Yeah. My name is Rebecca Palmatier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host. I say welcome. And we are studying some Psalms. We have, we're in week two, This the, the midday of week two. And today we're going to look at Psalms 26 through 31. But honestly, we're going to focus more on uh, 27, 28, and 29 today. So I'm going to wait just a second. If you are joining us, make sure to comment and say hi. Let me know that you're here. Let me know that the signal is good. Like Suzanne. Hey, good morning, Suzanne. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be live again with you guys today. Um, yesterday was a little different to upload the recording, but I didn't want us to miss the chance to be together. And honestly, uh, tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing as well. At the end of the year with the kids, there's lots of school activities and field trips and stuff. But um, but I want us to have the time together. So it's either I'll go really early live tomorrow or I'll record it and upload it. Yeah. Hey, Pastor Earl, good morning. All right, guys, let's go ahead and pray. Good morning, Karen. Aw, love you too. <laughs> good morning. Let's pray and then let's look at some Psalms together. Let's do it. God, thank you so much for drawing us to you. <sighs> we sense that right now. We sense your presence. We sense your Holy Spirit. God, help us set apart this time. Make this everyday space sacred as we draw close to you. In your name, amen. Amen. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me go ahead and pull up our slides for today. I want to remind you of the scriptures that we have planned to read this week so that if you wanted to read ahead for tomorrow's or Friday's that you could do so. Here it is. So today we're doing, uh, the reading is for Psalms 26 through 31. Tomorrow will be 32 to 36 and then Friday 37 to 40. Just want to remind you that we are, in this case, because we're looking at a broader selection of scripture. So we're not going to go verse by verse the way we sometimes do in our studies. We're going to look at a bigger picture. And then I might pick some some verses that kind of capture a thought or idea. So it's it's a little bit more of a higher look, a higher view, summary, maybe. Uh, but it's good for us to do that, right? Okay. These are the themes or titles for this selection of Psalms. And again, all of these Psalms currently, these ones are written by David. Um, prayer for vindication, this idea of God being a stronghold and a strength, the voice of the Lord, joy in the morning and a plea for protection. As I mentioned, um, I'm going to have us look, oops, sorry. I'm going to have us look a bulk in 27, 28, 29, but, um, but I encourage you to read all of them. I wish, man, I wish that we could go through all of them in our time, but I'm trying to be sensitive to that. And yet there's 150 Psalms. So us doing one Psalm a day, uh, probably isn't, isn't going to work as well for us. So there it is. Before we dig into these specific psalms, I wanted to point out one phrase or title of God that David uses often in this selection of psalms that we're looking at, and that's the name Yahweh. Now, some translations will actually substitute that word for Lord. And so like the translation I use most often here is the Christian Standard Version. Uh, we actually see the word Lord a lot. But the, the translation also uses the word Yahweh. So I want us to talk for just a brief moment about just the beauty or significance of David using that name for the Lord. All right. The reason I think it's really cool is because Yahweh is a personal covenant name of God. This name, we saw it, you know, uh, God spoke it with Moses. 
uh, what do I call you? You know, I am. This idea of Yahweh. Uh, I am that I am. Who, who am I? Who is God, right? Who is God? How do you describe him? How does God have a name? But this word, this, this name of Yahweh, it's personal. It's personal. It's not a like a, a title that necessarily describes a quality of him. You know, it's not like Jehovah Nisi or Jehovah Rapha or one of those that kind of gives us insight into a quality or nature of him. This one is a little bit, I don't know, the view is bigger. Um, and actually, even even scholars, there, there are kind of debates or nuances on how this how this name, the message that it's supposed to tell us about the name of God. So I put up a few here. Um, there's overall this idea of the name Yahweh as Lord. It either expresses God's quality of absolute being as the eternal, unchanging, dynamic presence, or it means he who causes to be. There's this sense of God being, like always was, always is, boom, right? There's always this, also this sense of God who makes everything else. God the creator, God the, the you know, origin, the beginning, the, him, Yahweh. So a, a few nuances, uh, I grabbed a few different variations, and, and this is on a really cool study in the Lexham Bible Dictionary. But Yahweh, this idea, it could be he who causes to be, I will be who I will be. There's another a phrase um, or another suggestion that God saying I am that I am was almost a, a little bit of a rebuffing, saying, well, that doesn't really concern you. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting, this implication of, you know, doesn't, doesn't really concern you. Hi, Judy, Stephanie, Darlene. Good morning, guys. Yahweh, I am the self-existent one. I am the one who is. Uh, there is one scholar, Jacob Milgram. I included this because I thought it was cool. Some we, we might look at those phrases and say, you know, yeah, they're all the same thing. But there's little there's little nuances. And I think it's those nuances that that give us mm, like kind of like intrigue. You know, and, and so Jacob, he had said that it's more than just like this existence of being. He was implying that it's like an imperfect translation, meaning um, I am present. I will continue to be present like this future thing as well. So I included that because I thought that was beautiful. All right. So this overall idea of Yahweh, just recognize that it is it is a relational, personal name of God, not just a title, not just a religious phrase. This is this is connection. This is relationship. And that's the word that David is, is often going to use when he's saying Lord in these Psalms. It's this close thing. Is that making sense? I just wanted to point that out as we go to read these, because I think sometimes we see words like Lord or God or whatever. I don't know, maybe we miss that. So I just wanted to point that out this morning. Let's take a look. Uh, Psalm 26 is a prayer for vindication. Vindication, by the way, what does that word mean? Um, that is an idea of judgment, like, um, like to bring justice to. That's to vindicate. And the psalm starts off, the very first words are, vindicate me, Lord. Vindicate me. I, I didn't grab all of the, the verses, but I did grab a few for us to look at. So the opening phrase, vindicate me, Lord, because I have lived with integrity and have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Verse four, he says, I do not sit with the worthless or associate with hypocrites. I hate a crowd of evildoers. I do not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, Lord, raising my voice in thanksgiving, telling about your wondrous works. The, the kind of structure or maybe perspective that David has as he's writing this, he's saying, um, God, bring justice to me. 
I am not doing these other things. And so in that sense, it, it, there's a negative framework, not that he's being negative, but he's the, I'm not this, I'm not that, okay? So, oh, there we go. From the Holman Concise Bible Commentary, I, lo I love this quote that said, although this psalm is in the form of a negative confession, saying, I don't do these things, right? It is not a prideful boast on the psalmist's part. Rather, it teaches the kind of life one must follow to be a part of God's assembly. We could go on, on a, a bigger tangent there talking about um, how none of us are truly worthy and able to perfectly earn the ability to enter God's presence, right? We're not going to do that today, but suffice to say, none of us are perfect. Uh, but Jesus does step in and then he covers us with his robe of righteousness that puts us in right standing with God, right? And we can come into God's presence. But the heart that David shares in this is this idea that I, as a follower of God, am making my best effort to serve and honor you. And, and that is basically the supporting information that, that David, the writer, is saying for why God should vindicate him. God, vindicate me. I'm, I'm one of your people. I, on, I honor you. I, I live to serve you. And I don't want to... Um, to disobey or dismiss the things that matter to you. Yeah. Verse eight and nine, I just, I love this. And so I included them. He says, Lord, I love the house where you dwell, the place where your glory resides. I, to me, I, as reading, I, whenever I read through Psalms or any selection of scripture really, in the back of my mind, I'm always like, okay, what if there's one verse that captured my heart, maybe one that I want to try to memorize to really just kind of stew on for a while, what is it? And in Psalm 26, that verse 8 is it for me. You know, God, I, I love, I love your presence. I love where you dwell. Take a look again. I love the house where you dwell. That's like this, this space where you dwell, the place where your glory resides. 9 and 11, I, I included these and kind of put a color highlight on them. He says, do not destroy me along with sinners or my life along with men of bloodshed. Uh, verse 10, he just continues describing those men. But verse 11, but I live with integrity as in I'm not like that. And he says, so redeem me and be gracious to me. That captures the heart of the psalm. He opens up with, vindicate me, Lord. Bring judgment. I'm doing my best to honor you. There's, I want there to be a clear separation in my life versus those that just blatantly do evil. I want to walk with integrity. I love your presence. So, Lord, please come. Please come. Don't treat me the way that you would other sinners. Yeah? Redeem me and be gracious to me. Psalm 27 is called my stronghold. And this is how it opens. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread? Whom should I dread? Sorry. When evildoers came against me to devour my flesh and my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I see verse one, right? The Lord is my light and my salvation, right? And uh, if you've been in church a while, I'm thinking of this, you know, 90s worship song by Daryl Evans called, Whom Shall I Fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Yeah, it's literally singing this song. I love it. I can't help it when I see songs that have those words. And man, I just love when worship songs are like taking scripture and putting it to melody so we can remember it, right? So he's saying my stronghold, which means like it's like this, this um, foundation, this anchor, this, this thing that sustains and, and holds tight. 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Yeah? From the Holman Concise Bible Commentary, uh, the scholar wrote, The one who loves God is secure, even in the tribulations of life, because he or she is accepted in the arms of God. And so that's why in verse 3, when he says armies are deploying against him and war breaks out against me, after each of those phrases, which communicates like this environment that would not be secure, David, the writer, quickly responds and points to his security and his confidence remaining because it's not anchored in whatever's going on in the moment. His security, uh, his anchor, his confidence is in the Lord himself. There's a verse after, I just included it because, again, this is another verse in Psalm 27, if I had to pick out a verse that I love. Um, and again, this is related to worship. But verse four, I have asked one thing from the Lord. It's what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. Yes. Verse five and six, uh, I bring because it, it captures the other half of what was being described in the Holman Concise Bible Commentary. This idea that uh, security is coming through the Lord. Verse five, for he will conceal me in his shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Before we move on, I just, if you are in a space, a season, because we know life is all seasons, right? Some seasons are harder than others. Some seasons you feel like there's a lot of obstacles or challenges or, or even opposition, which means like this opposing force, right? If you're in one of those seasons, I encourage you to take Psalm 27 and meditate on it. Like read it over and over. Maybe take verses through the week and, I don't know, write them on post-its, place it where you can see it. Um, if you're at all creative or musical, maybe uh, take a verse and like do a page of artwork on it. Or if you're musical, you know, make a melody that goes with it and sing it. Find whatever way you can to really let that those words anchor in your heart. Because just like the writer saying, even though these things could be coming up against me, I can be secure because my security is in the Lord who will be my refuge who will be this strength and this comfort and this deliverer. Yeah. Hi, Gloria and Flo, good morning. Judy, did I say good morning to you, friend? All right, let's keep going. Psalm 28, my strength. Now, uh, someone might say, well, wait a minute, is this just like the Psalm that was before it, right? Because we we're just talking about God being a stronghold. Actually, this Psalm is quite different. Uh, but let's take a look here. Verse 3, he says this, Do not drag me away with the wicked, with the evildoers, who speak in friendly ways with their neighbors with, while malice is in their heart, like deception. Verse 4, Repay them according to what they have done, according to their evil deeds. Repay them according to the work of their hands. Give them back what they deserve, because they do not consider what the Lord has done or the work of his hands. He will tear them down and not rebuild them. The way that I feel that this psalm is different is that the, the beginning especially really focuses on these people that are the opposition, these people that, you know, are doing evil, that are deceptive and um, malice, you know? The first part of the psalm speaks a great deal pointing to that. So it it's not just saying, yes, God, you are my strength, even though that's what this psalm is, is supposed to be about. It starts off talking about these, these people. But I want to point out to you, look at verse 4, all right? 
Repay them according to what they've done, according to the evil of their deeds. Repay them according to the work of their hands. Give them back what they deserve. The psalmist prayed for mercy for himself, even as he prayed that God would punish evildoers. This came not from selfishness, but a profound sense of right and wrong. This sticks out to me because, hey, there are some psalms like this one where David or the writer is totally calling out other people for the things that they're doing that are wrong and asking God to judge them, asking God to, um, to vindicate and, and pass judgment on the people that did wrong things. And I couldn't help as, as we read this. I, I can think back to a few times um, even early on in, in my own faith, right? Like sometimes you and I encounter difficult people, right? I would, I would see people who, lo- you know, love Jesus, want to get into the word. They'd come to a passage like this and they'd be like, yeah, God, stick it to him, <laughs> right? Like that person that's driving me crazy, yeah, bring, the, bring it back on them, right? And they're really quick to kind of, you know, grab this verse and proclaim it or other verses like it, you know, with that same message. And what I would say is, and I, I, that's why I included that quote from, uh, from the source there, is it's not about me versus them. In fact, I think if we take that posture, we honestly miss the heart of God. Because God's heart is for all people. What he hates is sin. What God is going to bring uh, judgment against is sin. But God's heart is for us as imperfect beings, and it's also for those difficult people in your life too, right? But in this case, what the writer is speaking about is not just, oh, that person is driving me crazy, God, take them out. He's saying, Lord, there is evil happening, and it's wrong, right? See, it's about it's about the sense of right and wrong, and he's saying, Lord, please deal with the wrong, Deal with the wrong. Let, let the wrong not prosper, you know. Little difference. Little difference. I hope you can sense that. All right. And then we can see in verse 5, because they do not consider what the Lord has done or the work of his hands, he will tear them down and not rebuild them. What the writer David is saying, he's saying, all right. God does not allow injustice to remain unpunished. God does not allow injustice to remain unpunished. Yeah. If you have been in a season, maybe where you feel like there's been opposition against you or even wrongs against you, where people have wronged you, I pray that you can find a measure and comfort, not necessarily that, that everything as you see it is going to unfold the way that you feel it should be, but recognizing that God will hold all things accountable. God is a God of justice. It would be wrong for him to, um, to turn a blind eye. And God doesn't do that, even though in the moment you might look around and say, well, it seems like that person is unchecked, you know? Lean back into the Lord. Uh, Lean back into this personal covenant relationship that you have with him. And remember that God is a God of justice. He does not allow, allow injustice to remain unpunished. Okay. Psalm 28 continues. I included this because, again, we've talked before about beat changes um, beat changes, this idea that the, the speaker is focusing in on this thing and then there's a shift and then maybe they focus on this thing instead. At verse 6, there's a beautiful beat change and I just wanted us to look at it together. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard my the sound of my pleading. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart celebrates and I give thanks to him with my song. The Lord is the strength 
of his people. That's where this theme comes from, right? The Lord is the strength of his people. He is a stronghold of salvation for his anointed. Save your people, bless your possession, shepherd them, and carry them forever. After the writer, David, after he's pointedly asked God to uh, justly respond to the injustice that is happening, he, he has confidence that it's going to happen. He doesn't continue to plead his case as if God doesn't hear him. In fact, he has uh, praise because he recognizes that God does hear his cry, that God will be responding and handling this in the best way that God knows how to handle it, right? God knows better than us. But he can say, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Yeah. I wanted us to spend the bulk of our time in that Psalm 28. Uh, I don't know, my heart was just really there this morning and I hope it ministered to you. But before we go, I just wanna give like this little bonus about Psalm 29. So Psalm 29 is called the voice of the Lord. And of all of the Psalms that are in our selection for today, this one is the most distinct, in my opinion, the most distinct because it, it describes the voice of the Lord. Like in the beginning of Psalm 29, like it'll say um, ascend. It's like this calling for beings to give praise to the Lord. But then it's, it starts describing the voice of the Lord. I want to show you. So verse one and two <clears throat> give this call for worship, right? Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And then verse three, the voice of the Lord is above the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord above the vast water, the voice of the Lord in power, the voice of the Lord in splendor. In the psalm, it's not very long, but there's, I think it's like 12 or 13 or 14, right around there, different times that it describes the voice of the Lord. And some of the, some of the descriptions are a little weird, like the cedars of Lebanon. We'd be like, well, what's that? Cedars of Lebanon were these very ancient trees that were very, very, very strong strong like the the strongest like beautiful eloquent uh, elegant wood like it was it was very luxurious and long lasting right describes the voice of the lord like that there are two perspectives that i just wanted to share as we wrap up with this one of them points to the voice of the lord and this idea of thunder <clears throat> like a storm and this is what uh, one scholar had to say about it, a terrible storm displays the power of God. The thunder and rain, lightning and wind all speak of his power. It provokes his people to praise. And I, I'm like, yeah, yeah. It describes this magnificent, you know, trying to capture the voice of God. Boom, right? Like profound. But there's a second summary kind of perspective that I want to show you as we wrap up today. This writing, if I would say, you know, strategic isn't probably the best word, but it's crafted. It's well crafted. And there are some scholars that actually suggest that this psalm written by David um, was doing more than just describing God and his greatness, but was actually pointing to or giving contrast to two other big pagan gods of the time, which is Baal and Yam. Baal was god of the skies and Yam was like this god of the seas. And so here, the writer, as they're describing God's greatness, which surpasses, it's bigger, <clears throat> excuse me, it's bigger than <clears throat> being god of the sky or god of the sea. Our god is all of it greater than all of it, you know? So I just thought that was really interesting. I, I love that connection. I just wanted to show it to you. And this is from the Faith Life Study Bible. The psalmist uses the, the mythology of Baal and Yam to proclaim Yahweh's glory and strength over 
other gods. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. The glory, the God of glory thunders. The Lord above the vast water. The voice of the Lord in power. The voice of the Lord in splendor. I encourage you today as we wrap up, um, maybe take a minute and read through some of those other descriptions that David uses to try to capture the, the depth and the breadth and the power and the magnificence of the voice of the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for friends that we get to dig into your word together. We get to stew on and meditate on your scripture. Thank you, God. Let it continue to resonate in our hearts as we go about our day. In your name, amen. Amen. That's it for today, guys. Do me a favor, hit the share button. Invite other people into this journey, this um, desire to get into God's word every day. You know, God's word is good, right? And when we take the time, God always shows up. Yeah. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.